Welcome to the first segment of making our router table. And I feel that has to be making the top. Because I know a lot of y'all out there would appreciate having a router table in order to build a router table. And if we can actually get the top finished, completed, and working, you could set it on a set of sawhorses, or if you're like me, some shop stools or something like that. So you can use it in later steps if you want to. Now, the design I'm doing for this router table is nothing unique. In fact, if you've watched other YouTubers or even Norm Abrams, it's a very consistent theme of laminating sheet goods together to make the top. But I am going to show you a few tips and techniques to get that top optimal so that you won't have any problems in the future with sagging or it going convex or something like that. Now what I'm talking about there is the reference area between the bit and your workpiece. For the most part, our router plates that are attached to our router lifts or the insert you're buying, they are manufactured to high, high standards to be dead flat. So that's going to be your reference surface. And in, the ide in an ideal world, your router table itself would be perfectly in line. That way, when you registered a piece of wood and ran it over the table, as long as if the piece was longer than the plate itself, the table itself is not going to interact with it. The worst thing that could happen is to have your router plate sag so that it is in a slight concave situation. Because in that situation, the tips are actually going to cause the board you're working on to be above the plate. And in order to get a consistent reference point, you're going to have to press down to actually flex that board into the plate itself. Now, for the most part, we're only talking a few thousandths of an inch or maybe a 64th of an inch. So it's not that big a deal, but it's something you have to think on and it makes your router table inconsistent. That is why if you buy an iron tabletop or a steel tabletop, a lot of times they will spring those just a little bit so that they taper off on the end so that you can be guaranteed that your piece is going to register on the bit itself and this will just support your weight as you go off and if it does sag a tad bit over time it kind of out counteracts that springing and we're again we are talking you know fractions of a millimeter or a thousandth of an inch or something like that difference but the potential for it, either one of those to happening is a result of the material you're using and how you're attaching it to your frame or carcass. Now, if money is no object, by far, buy yourself a nice iron or steel router tabletop from a reputable manufacturer. That added weight will dampen a lot of stuff and it will probably make your router a lot quieter. But those of us in the real world, we're stuck with probably laminating sheet goods together. Now, if you're looking for ultimate flatness, probably the first place a lot of people are going to be stepping is to MDF, because it's pretty much the flattest sheet good you can get from the manufacturer right from the get-go. The problem I have with MDF has to deal with moisture. It does absorb moisture from the atmosphere, and if you have a very heavy weight suspended across it, what happens is as it gains the moisture, it kind of softens and sags a little bit, which is absolutely positively what we do not want. But the big problem is as it loses that moisture, it doesn't spring back. It stays sagging. And now if you're doing a veneered tabletop for a kitchen or something like that, MDF is perfect because if it sags a little bit, this is going to be unnoticeable. But for a precision machine or as precise as we can for woodworking, that sagging would be noticeable. Now, uh, plywood is a great alternative to that if you get a good sheet of plywood. You know, Baltic birch comes out pretty flat from the factory, and if you don't have it setting in your shop or leaning against a wall, it will pretty much stay flat, uh, but it can be pricey. And me on a budget, I'm going plywood but I'm going to go with the cheapest stuff. We're talking big box store, uh, you know, voids in the middle, not enough ply, super thin on top, $30 for a four by eight sheet of type of plywood. I'm talking the quality that some people wouldn't even consider good enough for shop 
furniture. I mean, this stuff, when you buy it, just comes as a potato chip. But there are some ways of mitigating that warpiness in the build itself. The, the chassis you have, you can lock it down to keep it flat. But what I would do when I'm kind of at this price point quality low eyes is I will go to the big box store, I'll buy the flattest sheet I can find there, I'll bring it straight back to my shop, and somehow I will register it flat. Maybe it's sitting on the concrete, or I put it on stools or something like that, and I will leave it that way for about a week with a lot of weight on top of my reference points. That way, as the moisture is leaving the plywood, it's less likely to potato chip. And a week is about all it takes for it to be less cool to the touch. This is still a little bit cool, but there are also techniques when you're laminating it together that I'm going to cover that will help maintain its flatness over the long term. Now the next consideration is the size you want your top to be. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm copying out a little bit. I'm just going to go with a 32 by 24 size router tabletop because that seems to be the most consistent size out there if people are buying iron tabletops and some of y'all might want to do that one instead of building your own and just build the undercarriage but for me it's an upgrade path in the future and it seems about right uh, so going right there so i would i'm going to mark out 34 inches and then we're going to divide it up into at least three sections right here one's going to be for the very top that's going to be my table saw outfeed support and the other two I'm going to glue together for the router table. But I need this section right here because I just acquired a new circular saw. So I'm going to have to build some new jigs to allow it to cut. And this will be just enough for me to do that kind of stuff. Then width-wise, even though I want my project to be 24 inches, I'm marking out 26 inches right now. And I need to make sure I get at least two that size. You can go a little bit more, but don't go a little bit less. And you'll see why in a second. It all comes out to getting a perfectly square top. Now, while I took the time to put a straight edge down and cut these straight, it really didn't matter. I could have cut these sections out with a jigsaw freehand and my end product would have been just fine because these are oversized and all I needed was one straight, absolutely straight edge that I could reference either with a ruler and a straight edge like this or my table saw to square up everything. And what's nice about even cheap plywood is the edges that come from the factory are pretty much straight. They might not be square, but we can depend upon them being a straight line. Now, one of the things I have discovered that if you are wanting flat surfaces and you're starting out with basic potato chips, the key thing is you want to glue them down to a reference surface. It's the fact that you now have two pieces that you're gluing together. You can add tension in between the two pieces to fight any potato chipping, warping. So I do know that these are not dead flat. But my workbench in this area is. My workbench only dips on this one corner over here. So if I were to clamp these to my workbench on the corners, that will force them flat. And the glue bond in between these two will add tension to kind of compensate for those different thicknesses. Also, uh, the end product of this thing, I'm going to be putting a border because I do not like the side grain of this cheesy looking plywood. 
So I'm going to be putting a wood border. So not only do I have an extra inch here, but I also have an extra half inch or three quarters of an inch that I'm going to have for my border all the way around. So in order to square this up, I'm going to glue this so that the one factory edge hangs over a little bit. So I can use this as my reference on the table saw when I square this entire thing up. Now, simply clamping these edges to my workbench will make sure that we have good contact right there and there. But if you want a solid top, you have to make sure that there is no air gap in the middle. In order to take care of that, I'm going to use screws. But you could use calls where you take a board and you plane off, you know, whether a hand plane or a belt sander, a little bit on each side so that you end up with a slightly curved call. That way, it, whenever you bring that down and you stretch your clamps all the way to the top, not only will it put pressure on the outside, but that curved center will put pressure in the middle to press it down. Uh, I just don't have any boards I want to dedicate to that right now. And because we're going to be cutting out the center section for the uh, router uh, lift, it makes sense to me to just drill those in and then cut out that open section so we don't end up with screw holes in our top. So in order to figure out where I'm going to be putting screws so that I know I don't put them in an area that I might not want a hole, I'm going to go ahead and just lay out the entire table. That way I know where and where I shouldn't put screw holes. Just give myself a little bit of room for the ledge that I'm going to be putting in here. Just drill a bunch of holes. Now the problem with drilling holes is you are going to get some blowout on the other side. So you're going to have to make sure you clear off all of that debris so that you don't have any shavings in between the two pieces of wood. So for the glue up, just make sure you have both surfaces just really smooth and clean. You have to do a light sanding. This is the time to do it. I've already tested that one right there. Grab your glue, grab a spreader, and have at it. I do like these little silicon spatulas. They do a pretty good job, and it's kind of like those rockler little things. You can wipe them off after they dry, and it comes off real, real easy. This is no time to skimp on glue. Go ahead and spread it all out. Probably would have been smart for me to put some paper down, but oh well. Now when we lay these up, that one thing that we've got to watch out for is our reference side. The one we are using to cut our straight edge. We want that hanging over, you know, an inch to quarter inch. Just a little bit. Because... That's going to allow us to square everything up. And when you're screwing it down, I would start in the center and work your way out. That way you're squeezing any air bubbles out. And I'm using inch and a quarter number 10 screws here which are just big enough to slide into the hole without gripping the top board but cinching down to the board underneath because the idea is to squeeze the boards not join them so I've now got most of the clamps off and the very last screw, I've let this dry overnight, so we take off the last of the clamps and let's see how flat we got it. Pretty solid. Now, as I said earlier, I'm going to be squaring this up on my table saw, and since I don't have an outfeed table yet, we are using the traditional redneck outfeed table. 
fold up table with PVC pipes. So just begin squaring it up. I have my reference edge, that factory edge that's hanging over right here. I'm going to have that against my fence. I'm going to make two cuts. So those leave me with two parallel sides. Unfortunately, I have not built a crosscut sled big enough to be able to cut these edges yet. So I'm going to have to do those with either a hand saw or a circular saw and careful measurements. And this is how those of y'all that don't have a table saw can also do these parallel sides. It just takes a little bit more time. Now the first thing I like to do is find a center line. Maybe it's because I come from more of a hand tool background, but I find working from the center a lot more accurate than working from a side, especially if you're having to square stuff up. So I know these two are parallel, so I should be able to come over and there we go. Pretty much tells me that not only is my square square, but I can extend it all the way across. Got the center line. Now measure out from both of those to get my two sides and then we'll go check for diagonal. For me it is just a matter of using my circular saws crosscut sled and lining up the edge so I can make this cut as accurately as possible. And my general thought is I want to take the pencil line when I do these kinds of cuts. I just find it's easier to measure it that way. Repeat on the other side. And you will end up with one perfectly square router tabletop. Also, I really want you to notice how clean an edge you can get with a simple uh, circular saw sled because it acts somewhat like a zero clearance insert. And normally a circular saw, the blade is coming up, so you get all the chip out on the edge of plywood. That is as clean a cut as I could do with a nice quality table saw. Next, I want to trim this out. So I need to mill up some three-quarter by about inch and a half piece to go all the way around. But the key thing you need to pay attention to when doing this one is grain direction. You see, while this might just be shop equipment, we are using this as an exercise to the type of woodworking we want to do. And the pros, grain direction is everything. And me personally, I hate unintended cathedrals. That is one of the main reasons why I do not use plywood very often, because you are always going to get cathedrals. And in pine, construction pine that I'm using in my project, you know, the contrast between late growth and er uh, early growth is extreme. So if you have cathedrals appearing just randomly in your project, it's going to draw the eye. And cathedrals on the trim piece makes no sense whatsoever. It is a sure sign that somebody just didn't think their project through. So I just spent some time milling up a couple pieces of 2x12 material to three quarters of an inch thick here uh, and enough so I could get two pieces out of each board and I was looking for bastard grain grain running down the side that way whenever I cut off a piece I would have fairly straight grain running over the face on either side and as I pick out which boards to use I will be choosing 
the side where the grain is most consistent. So at a distance, as light bounces off of this, those light and darks will kind of blend together and it will look right to me. But having a cathedral in the middle of something like this, that just would not work. And in the next segment, video segment, I will be covering how I mill up construction lumber to get some nice furniture grade material. Now, if I was making something, a piece of furniture that I was actually going to sell using this kind of material, I would have even take it and go, for, go so far as to rip these so that the lines would be parallel with my cut. But you pick your battles, you pick what you want to learn with. I'm getting nice straight grain. I'm going to be happy for my shop project. So the next thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to cut two sides, two ends, just a tad bit thicker than my top. Now normally whenever I do a kind of mitered frame or something like that for, a, uh, for maybe like a picture or something like that, I just do that by hand. I think it's fun. Just lay out the line, saw down the line, and maybe trim it with a, a shooting board or your block plane or something like that to get it just dialed in perfect. And there's even a tech called kerfing where you can use a really thin saw blade to just kind of sneak up on the perfect fit. I always found that kind of fun. But I've got a new table saw and I got me a fancy miter gauge that has a preset 45 degrees. So I'm gonna try this technique first. And the first step is to pick my show face, uh, one with the thinnest grain, so that one, and that's gonna be going against the fence so that the miter is gonna be cutting on that side and this is gonna be glued to the uh, plywood. I'm gonna cut one miter on all the boards and then I'm gonna fit them and come back and do the second miter. So what do I mean by fitting it? Well, it's kind of a hand tool mentality, and then I'm going to fit the work to the board itself. It's not very hard to get a 45 degree on one end of a board. It's getting the length to be dead on perfect. So the first thing to do is sharpen up a pencil, really, really sharp. Okay. Then I'm going to take two boards and I'm going to label them to this corner. And I want to cut all my work in half. So once these are labeled, I'm not coming back to them. This is now my A corner. And if I fit these two to that corner perfectly, I can then mark this side with a pencil. And then if I go back to whatever tool I'm using and cut off the waist, make sure you mark your angle. Well, as long as I leave that line, I'm going to have a little bit of wiggle room that I could either plane off or ease into it. And I will just do this corner, that corner, and now I take the other two boards and do the same thing with them. So that I'm only having to fit two corners. I don't have to worry about the initial ones that came straight off that 45. Okay, that technique worked great. I only had to go back and shave down a little bit on two pencil lines, the two opposite corners I didn't fit. So the idea, the theory was sound. A lot quicker than doing it by hand if you had all that ex expensive equipment. But really just cutting a four, 45 miter isn't that big a deal, especially if you've taken the time to build yourself a uh, shooting board. Anyways, next up is gluing it. And it's just kind of like gluing up a mitered box. I tend to like to glue up one side, at one corner at a time. And as long as you've dry fitted and made sure it is dead perfect, that's completely acceptable. First step for me is to just lay some blue tape down and then position the two boards so that you're going to have that tight fit in the corner.
I also like to glue up just two at a time when I do this type of stuff. I just find it a lot less stressful. Uh, you've got one corner fitted and you've already dry fit it, so you know the other ones will fit. So just give these, you know, 15, 20 minutes to set. Do that side, then let it dry overnight, and then we will work on the rest of the top. And that means laminating on something slick and durable. I'm going to be using this white board on kind of a hardy board material I got at uh, the Blue Big Box store. It isn't my, much money. I want to say this uh, this sheet right here ran me a little over 10 bucks. But before we can laminate it on, we've got to prep our surface, which means we're going to have to flush cut this trim piece so that it is in line and then rough sand everything so it's going to accept the binding agents very, very well. So here's a quick trick because we are practicing doing more advanced skills that we can apply later on. This blue tape actually raises the uh, roller bit up off of the wood just a few thousandths of an inch. Not much. Not even the 64th. The more tape you put down, the more it rises up. Now when you're planning, they always tell you to go against the rotation of the bit. Because it's much safer if you go with the rotation of the bit, these blades have a chance to bite in like sneaker cleats and run, which can damage not only your work, but your body. I mean, lots of people get injured with runaway routers. So it is much, much safer to go against a rotation. The downside is you could be going against the grain, which will end up in te with tear out, or you can burn your work a lot easier. By doing this blue tape, I would do the much safer method of going against the rotation but then on the last step, I'm going to peel the tape off, and I'm going to do the climb cut, the more dangerous one. But because I'm now removing so little of the wood, there isn't much chance that the blade will bite in like sneaker cleats into the ground and run on me if I use proper technique. That's a big if. You have to know how to route first before you do this. I'm not saying this is an advanced step, maybe an intermediate, but it'll give you a better finish. So let's practice that when it doesn't really count how well we do. Okay, now coming out of raking in, go, can you see the transition between the uh, climb cut and the push cut? Yes, the push cut looks smooth, but see the color variations? Especially in the lighter, uh, softer woods compared to over here. It's just a lot smoother because it was a planing cut. This was actually going against the end grain, so you're getting minor tear out, which causes the fuzzier color. Just a much better result. So the last thing is just to give the top a good scrubbing so that we know that the binder will grab. I'm using 150 grit on just a little flat kind of foam back sand. Now before I glue this down, I am going to protect it with some blue tape because we're going to be routing, trimming it, all that kind of stuff, and just, just better safe than sorry. And while I do that one, I kind of want to talk about the types of glue I'm going to be using. Because they say this hardy board, you can use pretty much any kind of wood glue you want. Uh, it, it all works, yellow glue, uh, polyurethane, that kind of stuff. I do know that the people that have done similar tops before, like the Norm Abrams and stuff, they tend to prefer rubber cement because you can 
get it nice and tacky then you can kind of fold it down and lay it down to get all bubbles out and it's kind of a once once and done situation I'm gonna use high glue I haven't read anything that says that that can't be done but the reason why is I'm using the high glue is it is reversible and I just had a feeling that sometime in the future maybe I gouge the top or something like that I might want to just go buy another ten dollar whiteboard and remake the top and with a heat gun you can make the high glue, re glue release so I could just peel off the top sand off any residue residue and have at it again but I want you to think about what we have done so far. I mean, using sheet goods as a substrate to laminate something on top is a very traditional kind of way to make furniture. Mid-century furnitures, Art Nouveau's and stuff like that. They all use some kind of substrate and then just glue different veneers. Some of those veneers might have been Art Intarsia or that kind of stuff, but it's just getting that veneer in. So. While we're only making a silly little router table, it is a great learning experience if that is the direction you want to go. And that's kind of the theme I want you all to get from what we're doing here is we're using shop builds to practice the kind of furniture we want to make in the future. Now the thing about high glue is it's not like other glues. It doesn't really soak into wood. It kind of sits on top and acts like a lubricant, which makes it great for things like dovetails. Because if you know if you put PVC, uh, excuse me, PVA glue on your dovetails, the fibers actually start to swell. That's why your dovetails oftentimes uh, fit perfectly when it's a dry fit. But whenever you go to put glue on, they swell up a little bit and get a little bit tighter. Plus, they are instantly tacky. High glue isn't instantly tacky. It stays a little bit liquid. It kind of floats on top and it acts like a lubricant, which means it flows a little bit better when you're kind of laying down, pushing out bubbles and laminates and stuff like that. Plus, it is reversible, as I said earlier. A little heat. If you screw up, you can heat it up and glue it back down. But it looks and smells kind of gross. So don't be too, you know, sparse with this stuff. Just really spread it on. You can see it's very liquidy. So it's going to go over a lot of it. But make sure you cover everything, especially up to the edges. Now, because you can see it's flowing so easily, that's why I put tape on the outside. Because if any does kind of flow over... It'll be a lot easier to clean up. Oh, one last thing about it. If you do use this stuff on dovetails because it is a nice lubricant, well, it also somewhat fills gaps pretty easy. So if you load up a hole, because it's not being absorbed into the wood, it's a tiny bit of a gap filler. So you can hide some of your uh, more aggressive cuts. Okay, there we go. We got a nice, slightly oversized cut. This has been scuffed up and sanded, so I'm going to kind of flex it, then just lay it down as close as I can to the middle. I have maybe an eighth of an inch overhang all the way around. And I did that on purpose, so I don't have to be too liberal. Wiggle it. Then I've got a J roller to, not sure how much this is going to do, but try and work as many air bubbles out as I can. Then go grab some clamps, stick some weight in the middle, and let it sit overnight. Luckily when I was clamping it up, I ran out of clamps. I didn't put a clamp right here, so it didn't quite seat perfectly. There's a small gap there. so. After I trim the excess out, I'll show you how to use heat to fix it because we used high glue.
haven't said it before, I hate NDF and Hardy Board. Yuck, yucky stuff. Now we can't leave this edge as is. It's just too fragile. It's actually kind of sharp. You'll end up cutting yourself if you just move your hand over it. So somehow we need to break it for both durability and safety. And you can do that with either a round over or a slight bevel. I'm going to do a bevel that's just the amount of this hardy board. And because it's not removing much material, I'm going to do it in a climb cut so I don't get as much chip out on that very edge. Well, there we go. The tabletop is done. So on the next segment, I think we will cover installing the top because I'm going to make a few jigs for that. So it'd, it'd make a whole segment all by itself. So let's see how this thing turned out. Well, the big reveal is it's just a big flat white board. But it's solid and let me test how flat it is with a straight edge. Well, to me, it's, it looks dead flat in this center section right here, but I've got a tad bit of a dip over there. I can't explain that. But, key thing is, it's not cupped. I'm happy. Oh, and that little gap that I thought was going to show up, well, it turned out to be pretty tight. It's not coming up at all. The technique is really simple. You would just use the heat gun, applied it all the way around, got it to the point where it wasn't touchable. And I did, on a test piece, really heat up this whiteboard material. It didn't affect it whatsoever. So much to the point where I could barely touch the backside. And that is more than hot enough to kind of remelt that high glue and get it so you can press it down and it will adhere again. And that's basically how they repair veneers. A lot of times veneers will peel up or maybe they need want to replace one piece. They can just heat up the material, peel up the old material, lay down the new stuff or reapply the old stuff. So come back for the next segment and we will Install our router plate.